Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we don't have as long as we probably all would want, so I think we should get started now. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you all and a very large and extremely distinguished looking audience you are, which is slightly nerve-wracking. Um, anyway, to welcome you to this year's Inner Temple Social Context of Law discussion. Um, and the, as you probably know, the series was created by the Inner Temple in 2015, so this is, I think, the fifth in the series. And just a tiny bit of background about our subject tonight. Uh, as we all know, especially in the current climate, the law and the courts are often required to address very difficult questions on which there are conflicting, but possibly equally plausible views. And the purpose of this series from its inception has been to uh, try to enhance an understanding of the law and its social importance when that sort of question arises. And as you all know, our topic tonight is Britain's unwritten constitution. Now clearly this country has been going through political turmoil as a result of different opinions over Brexit. Now we do not propose to go into the details of Brexit this evening relief, I think, for some of us. Um, our discussions are going to focus instead on how well our constitutional rules are operating, given the politics, whether any of the rules should be changed or reformed, and if so, how. Not necessarily going into details of exactly what reforms someone thinks might be a good idea, but how can it be done if it's going to be done? Now, you all know I hardly need to introduce our speakers, but perhaps a couple of words uh, would be in place. Um, professor Vernon Bogdanor on my left is research professor at the Institute for Contemporary British History at King's College London, and he's also professor of politics at the New College of the Humanities. He's published over the years extensively on the British Constitution, including most recently his book, Beyond Brexit, Towards a British Constitution, with a capital C in the Constitution. Uh, Lord Sumption, on my right, retired a year ago as a Justice of the UK Supreme Court. He delivered this year's Wreath Lectures, and they're now published as, under the title, Trials of the State, Law and the Decline of Politics. And he's an author and medieval historian, working, I think, on the fifth volume of his history of the Hundred Years' War. Now, just to explain the, the program this evening, um, each of our speakers is going to present his view uh, on this topic uh, for about 10 minutes. I shall then make a few minute, take a few minutes uh, with some comments about those issues. Our two speakers will then each have a further 10 minutes in which they may respond to each other, perhaps go into other issues. And after that, there will be a question and answer session uh, in which members of the audience may ask questions. And I shall probably say what I'm about to say again later, but it will be very helpful if people who do ask questions ask very short questions so that there's plenty of time for lots of people to answer questions and for our speakers to respond. And afterwards, there will be a drinks reception in the round of the church just behind us. So, I now invite Professor Vernon Bogdanor to be our first speaker. Vernon, over to you. Should I stand? Or sit? No, I should sit. Well, thank you very much. And I have to begin with two apologies. First, that um, I'm recovering from a cold, and I hope it doesn't show too greatly. But secondly, I'm probably one of the few people in this room who's has no legal qualification, so I hope I can be forgiven for that. I'd also like to begin by thanking Jonathan Sumption, both for delivering the wreath lectures and for, as it were, exposing himself to discussion of it. And I'd like to um, concentrate on two points in the lectures. First, the issue of the referendum, whether it has a place in our constitution, and secondly, the question of whether we should have a constitution at all. Now, Jonathan, I think, is unhappy about the referendum and certainly about the 2016 one, more unhappy in the lectures, perhaps, than in the printed version in the book. And in an interview with Prospect, he said it was a mistake to use a plebiscite in a parliamentary system. But almost every democracy employs the referendum, 
there are only four major stable democracies that have never used them. India, a large federal system. Israel, though there's provision for them in a basic law. Japan, though one is proposed for 2020. And the United States, though of course there are many referendums at state level. But uh, there was a lot of hostility to the first employment of the referendum in Britain, which was in 1975 on the European issue. And a year before, Monsieur Jean Ray, the ex-president of the European Commission, said that a referendum on this matter consists of consulting people who don't know the problems instead of consulting people who know them. I would deplore a situation in which the policy of this great country should be left to housewives. It should be decided instead by trained and informed people. Now, there are many Burkean objections to the referendum, which Jonathan employs, but Burke, of course, was writing before the era of party whips, and for this reason, legislative scrutiny in the Commons does not always result in major alterations to government policy, and uh, substantive Lord's amendments are not often accepted by the government. And Jonathan also says that Parliament is an arena which can secure compromise and said that he was opposed to the 2016 referendum because there were too many answers to the question posed other than yes or no. But whether or not we remain in the European Union is a binary decision. We are either in or out. We cannot be qualified members any more than we can be qualified virgins. Had the Brexit decision been left to Parliament, there would have to be a final vote on whether MPs wish to remain or leave. Now, a vote in Parliament follows a debate and scrutiny. A referendum widens the debate and widens the scrutiny so that it includes not just political professionals, but the people as a whole, who become, in effect, a third chamber of Parliament on this issue. The probability is that MPs would have voted remain. The majority are remainers. It appears from the referendum the majority of the people are not. So if you oppose the referendum, you suggest that Britain should remain in the European Union even though the majority of voters do not so wish to remain. The referendum was held precisely because the democratic system was not working. In the 1970 election, the first before we entered the European community, all three parties were in favor of joining. So there was no way in which a Eurosceptic voter could make her feelings felt. In 2015, there was one party which was opposed to our membership, and that was UKIP, but many people wouldn't wish to throw away their vote in our first-past-the-post system. UKIP won an eighth of the vote, but only one seat. And some decisions, it may be held, are so fundamental, they cannot be given legitimacy by Parliament alone. They also need the consent of the people. In particular, a decision to transfer the legislative powers of Parliament, either upwards or downwards, because we give our MPs a mandate to legislate, but not to transfer those powers away. That can only be given but through a specific mandate, which is a referendum. Uh, this is a principle, in my opinion, of liberal political philosophy. John Locke says in his second treatise of government, the legislative cannot transfer the power of making laws to any other hands, for it being but a delegated power from the people, they who have it cannot pass it to others. And it, it seems to me surprising that Jonathan's opposed to it, because in his fourth wreath lecture, he says, the, rightly in my view, the essence of democracy is participation, and he deplores the decline in public engagement. But the referendum led to an increase in public engagement a 72% turnout, the largest in any national election since 1992. A few years ago, we were worried about political apathy. Few people took much interest in politics. That worry seems to have disappeared. Perhaps we should be careful what we wish for. In my view, the high turnout in the referendum was a striking illustration of democratic commitment on the part of the least fortunate in British society. The greatest threat to democracy, in my view, is an inert electorate one that has ceased to think about public issues. John Stuart Mill wrote, as we do not learn to read or write, to ride or swim by being merely told how to do it, but by doing it, so also we learn about democracy by actually practicing it. And therefore, it seems to me the arguments against referendums 
are also in part an argument against democracy. I now want to turn to the question of whether we, could have a, we should have a constitution. And I think that question is wrongly posed. The question is not why we should have one, but what is special about Britain as a democracy that we shouldn't? There are only two other democracies which don't have one. New Zealand, with a population of five million, uh, a half the size of Greater London, a broadly homogenous and consensual society, we are multinational, multicultural, multidenominational, a society in which, as Jonathan acknowledges, consensus and conventions are breaking down. Israel, the other democracy, is moving towards a constitution through basic laws. Now, of course, a constitution it cannot prevent a determined dictator, cannot prevent a Hitler. It's a fallacy from that to assume they cannot secure some protection. We all lock our doors though they won't be protection against very determined burglars, Hitlers of crime, as it were, we still protect ourselves through an insurance policy. And this seems to me particularly important in the light of Brexit, which removes us from the protection of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which enable judges to disapply statutes or parts of statutes for friends against fundamental rights, and returns us to the unprotected constitution that we had before 1973. Now, the other 27 member states of the European Union will, of course, continue to be bound by the Charter. So I conclude with a question. Are our MPs so much more sensitive to human rights than the legislators of the other 27 member states that they should be entrusted with this important power of protecting our rights? And the answer to this question I leave to the audience. Bernard, thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, Lord Sumption. Uh, I'm going to deal with Vernon's, Vernon's points in the reverse order. Uh, he asks, why should we not have a written constitution when every other country in the world, or almost every other country, does? Uh, the short answer to that uh, is that our history is different from that of almost every other country in the world. The godfathers of written constitutions are war, revolution, invasion, and decolonization. Uh, with the exception of the last, these are all uh, serious misfortunes for any society, and we have been fortunate enough not to suffer from any of them. Uh, it seems to me that the idea that one should, so to speak, demolish what we already have and reconstruct it from, from a square one uh, is uh, unwise, to put it mildly. Um, we have a large accretion uh, of practices and rules which do amount to a constitution. They are not codified, uh, but uh, they are intelligible, and they are all, in one way or another, uh, emanations of three basic constitutional principles on which the British state has been founded for a very long time. One, Parliament is the supreme legislative authority. Two ministers of the Crown are answerable to Parliament for their exercise of executive power. And three, an independent judiciary interprets and applies the law, including the law of the Constitution. Now, uh, I uh, think that those are all sound principles, uh, and it does not seem to me uh, that uh, experience suggests that a written constitution or a codified constitution is required either to embody those principles or to set out more detailed rules that follow from them. Any constitutional rule can be created, amended, or abrogated in this country by ordinary parliamentary legislation, as has happened, for example, with devolution or changes to the rules for dissolving parliament. There are only two respects in which codifying our constitutional rules would make any serious difference. One is that any written constitution worthy of the name would serve as the supreme law of the land and would entrench the rules so that they could only be altered by some special procedure, such as a supermajority or a referendum. And the other is that by formalizing the rules, it would expand the role of the judiciary, 
as Alexis Tocqueville said about the United States Constitution, it means that every constitutional question and most political questions are ultimately judicial questions. Would that be in our interest? I doubt it. The classic defense of our existing constitutional arrangements is as strong today as it ever has been. Uh, they enable constitutional change to occur without any formal process of amendment, uh, which means that it can, adopt, uh, it can adapt to fundamental changes in our values and in our society by a process of evolution and without violence. Just look at the changes which our constitution has weathered over the three centuries in which it has had the same basic constitutional framework. The demise of the monarchy, the onset of industrialization, the arrival of mass democracy, two world wars, the acquisition and loss of a worldwide empire, uh, devolution to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, joining and now leaving the EU. We have weathered all of those fundamental changes in our national arrangements with substantially the same basic constitutional framework. And that has only been possible because it is informal and uncodified. What other state, with the arguable exception of the United States, can say as much? France is on its fifth republic since the, 18th, the end of the 18th century. Italy is on its fourth constitution since 1848. And each of these new constitutions has been associated with violent disruption, revolution, or war. Let's look for a moment at the arguable exception, the United States. What the United States experience illustrates is that a written and law-based constitution is a tremendous agent of conservatism and immobility. In Citizens United, the Supreme Court of the United States decided that all attempts to limit spending on election campaigns by corporations were unconstitutional. Because that is now a rule of the US Constitution, it cannot be changed until the end of time unless the Supreme Court changes its mind or a constitutional amendment is passed by a two-thirds majority of each House of Congress uh, and approved by three-quarters of the state legislatures. That is not only extraordinarily rigid, but it hands a blocking power to powerful vested interests, a problem which can be seen perhaps at its most extreme in the successive unsuccessful attempts to introduce gun control uh, in the United States. The US Constitution has served the United States well over a long period, principally because of the singular economic and social good fortune of the United States, which has made it unnecessary for them to contemplate its defects with any care. But I very much doubt whether it will weather well in an age of relative decline, which I believe that the United States is likely to experience uh, over the next century, as we have done uh, over the last century. Take another example. Spain has a constitution which codifies the relations between the state and its regions. This has made it very difficult to compromise with Catalan nationalists in the way that we have compromised in this country with Scottish nationalists. The result has been violence, discord, and the jailing of a large number of Catalan nationalists. We'll take an example closer to home. Uh, our one attempt to entrench a constitutional provision uh, is the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, a piece of legislation which is perfectly sensible in itself but did not cater for the particular crisis that we are now going through. It took a one-line act passed by a simple majority to get us out of the parliamentary impasse that it created. Imagine the mess that we would now be in if that act had been written into a codified constitution as it doubtless would have been if such a constitution had been drafted uh, in 2011. Uh, now, turning to the referendum, which is a, a particular aspect uh, of uh, the problem, uh, it seems to me that the a uh, problem about the referendum has to be looked at in the light of a larger picture of the way that parliamentary parties work. Politics is a marketplace. Over the medium to long term, uh, parties tend to adapt their po policy offerings to what they believe the public will support. It is absolutely true that until relatively recently, 
all the major parties in the House of Commons were in favour of membership of the EU. But I have absolutely no doubt that in the long term, uh, the parties would have adapted their offering. They would have become more sceptical. The Conservative Party would probably have become a Brexit party. The effect of the referendum uh, has been uh, to accelerate that process, uh, resulting in very considerable political and economic disruption. Now, referenda uh, have more than once been described as instruments of, of despotism and division, uh, and the truth of that adage seems to me to have been rather strikingly illustrated by the last three years of this country's history. The basic objection uh, to a referendum is that it is a device for circumventing the political process. Now, the political process does not always work as it should, and there are other reasons, uh, apart from the referendum, why it is not functioning very well at the moment. But it is at least potentially a way of finessing divisive issues so as to produce a result that no one perhaps would have chosen as their preferred option, but the widest possible range of people can live with. The political process is essentially a mechanism for accommodating divisions of interest and opinion in our society so that we can live together. It is by far the most effective way, in my view much more effective than law, uh, of avoiding so-called majoritarian tyranny. Now, a referendum avoids that kind of accommodation. What we have seen over the past three years is persistent attempts to force government to compromise on EU membership given the large and vocal minority that strongly believes in the advantage of EU membership. Parliament has accepted the result of the referendum while seeking compromise solutions such, for example, as continuing membership of the customs union or a high degree of assimilation to EU norms after we leave. The whole process has uh, as it seems to me, divided families and friends. It threatens to sunder the regions of the United Kingdom. It has coarsened the language of political debate, bringing us close to some very ugly totalitarian attitudes. It has caused government to reach for imposed solutions, sidelining the principal democratic organ of our state, namely Parliament. And I think that the suggestion that this is how democracy is supposed to work is frankly absurd. Now, in addition, uh, to these general points, which apply to referenda as such, uh, there are serious problems about this particular referendum. It was not uh, a binary question, to use uh, Vernon's phrase. It was a large number of questions, many of which are questions of degree. Do we want to leave in principle? What should our relations be after uh, leaving in principle? Uh, that's the argument, that's the answer, the, the issue that we have essentially been arguing about for the last three years. What price is it worth paying for leaving? These are, of course, related questions, but the idea that this is a simple yes or no issue uh, is, to my mind, untenable. Um, so I adhere to the view which I have expressed more than once, that an attempt to introduce direct democracy into a fundamentally parliamentary system is a serious mistake. I think it can only work if the referendum is confirmatory of parliamentary legislation, as was the case with the Scottish devolution referendum of 79 and the alternative vote referendum of 2011. Other countries which have a referenda generally adopt this system. In France and in Switzerland, for example, which provide for referenda in their constitutions, it is absolutely required uh, that there should be precise legislative proposals approved by Parliament uh, before the referendum, which will come into effect automatically upon a referendum uh, approving them. Uh, it seems to me that we have made a serious mistake in choosing this mode of decision-making at all, uh, and uh, that we have made a particularly serious mistake in doing it in this particular way. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Now, there's a... A, you can, we can all see that there are a very wide range of really rather complex issues um, in what our two speakers have said. I just want to add a few comments before we move on for each speaker to respond and say what else they, they want to. Um, 
One of the points, I think, about the referendum that, that we are now uh, concerned about is that it is taken to imply a move away from representative democracy towards populist democracy. And I think a lot needs to be thought about what the relationship between those two very different uh, forms of democracy might be, what it is now and what it could be um, in the future, especially if we should actually take steps to achieve a written constitution. The next, um, I think both us, well, certainly Vernon, uh, was talking about the fact that written constitutions generally give power to a Supreme Court or a constitutional uh, court to, if you like, enforce the constitution if either the government or the legislature are um, acting or legislating in breach of that constitution. And I think the question that, one of the many questions that arise then is whether such a power and the exercise of such power by the courts might lead to the politicization of judicial appointments. For example, by giving the prime minister the right, the sole right to uh, propose new appointments or giving the prime minister or parliament a veto over a suggested appointment. Uh, would that be a good thing? What, does that, what would that tell us about the rule of law? And next, um, I think part of what Vernon is saying, although he's not had time obviously to go into it, is that we might adopt a codified constitution, that is to say a document which includes the main important rules of our system of government. No one thinks that you could put everything in a written document um, unless you are not bothered about burning trees or, or, or ruining forests. Um, so the question, if we do move into a system where we're talking about adopting a written constitution, is who would be forward, would, would be responsible for putting forward formal proposals for constitutional change? We might have a lot of individuals and organizations saying we need this, that, and the other, uh, but would some particular body have responsibility for dealing with that and coming up with uh, well-thought-out proposals? Should a royal commission perhaps be appointed to draft proposals for a written constitution? If that was to happen, how tight should its terms of reference be? One can imagine members of the public having quite large shopping lists of things that ought to go into a constitution. Um, I mean, I should probably get ticked off for mentioning animal rights, for example, but animal rights aren't mentioned in many written constitutions, but there might be some. Would it be legitimate, for example, for um, a party during an election campaign to publish its proposals for a written constitution in its manifesto, and if it wins the election, then to say, right, we've got a mandate, we're going ahead with this written constitution, um, or a constitution with these terms in it. Can we actually envisage a British Parliament agreeing to a new constitution which limits their power or increases the power of government as against the Parliament? How could that be resolved? A referendum? Who would be voting to have the referendum? So these are some of the issues, and there are a lot more, but I think having had my chance to say a few words, I shall now ask Vernon, would you like, you've got your next 10 minutes now. Well, thank you. Um, on the uh, question of the referendum, uh, wherever it's used in almost every country, it serves to supplement representative democracy. It does not replace it. Referendums are used infrequently everywhere except in Switzerland and to some extent Australia, which are outliers. Um, I think Jonathan exaggerates the responsiveness of politicians to public opinion. In 1979, three of the four major parties in Wales supported devolution. Only the Conservatives, the minority party, opposed it. It was rejected in a referendum by four to one would it have been right to impose it on the Welsh when they didn't want it? In 2004, two of the three major parties in the North East favoured regional devolution, um, non-legislative devolution, I beg your pardon, in the North East. Only the minority Conservatives opposed it, but it was defeated by four to one. Would it have been right to impose institutions on the North East which they didn't want? In the early years of the 21st century, Tony Blair wanted Britain to join the Euro, 
but had been induced to say that you couldn't do that until there was a referendum. He never put forward the referendum because there wasn't a single opinion poll that showed a majority for the euro. So in that sense, the referendum's a weapon of entrenchment against changes which the public do not want. In Northern Ireland, I think the referendum has defused extremism by showing it does not have majority support. And it did also in France under the Gaullist regime by showing that the extremists over Algeria did not have majority support. The damage that's been caused since 2016 has not been because of the referendum, but because of Parliament. The referendum itself was advisory, and Parliament would have been within its rights in rejecting the outcome. It did not do so. In 2017, it passed the Notification of Withdrawal Act by a majority of 384 votes, authorizing Theresa May to invoke Article 50. But since then, it has failed to implement uh, the outcome. It has willed an end without willing the means. So I think we don't face, as Jonathan has said elsewhere, a constitutional crisis or a democratic crisis, but a parliamentary crisis because Parliament has been unwilling to implement the outcome of the referendum. An outcome, I should say, that I, I put myself opposed. I voted on the minority side. Now, on the question of a constitution, uh, Jonathan is right that our history is different from that of most, uh, almost every other country, almost every other democracy. And he gives Burkean arguments, really, as to why we shouldn't have a constitution. But I think Burke is no longer a guide because, as I think he acknowledges, many of the conventions and the customs have been broken. They no longer exist. It was said at the beginning of the 20th century by one authority that our system of government is based on tacit understandings. But unfortunately, the understandings are not always understood. And I think this is, has become even more so that the consensus we had as late as the 1950s has broken down. Society then was deferential, the country was broadly homogenous, and people broadly did what their betters told them to do. There were strong communal ties at that time. There's been a huge movement away from that, and a response to real changes which have undermined it, in particular the development of free markets and globalization, which is not compatible with the communal ties of a Burkean philosophy. Now, it's of course true that a constitution would give judges more influence. Uh, they would be the ones who would interpret the constitution. That's absolutely right. And the question is whether we should be frightened of that. Now, I don't want judges to decide how much we should spend on the National Health Service. That is clearly not a judicial matter. But I do want judges to decide on matters of human rights, particularly when we are dealing with small and unpopular minorities. And indeed, we have, since 1973, actually been living under a constitution in practice because Parliament has been a subordinate legislative body to the institutions of the European communities and then the European Union. And that was, as it were, emphasized by the European Union a Charter of Fundamental Rights, which I greatly welcomed. And it was because small and unpopular minorities might be in danger, particularly in periods of panic, that Lord Scarman was the first judge in 1974 to advocate a British Bill of Rights, by which he meant, I think, uh, something that was actually uh, justiciable. Now, um, therefore, there is, I think, a case for a constitution which protects human rights, but even more urgently for a constitution which delineates the relationships between Westminster and subordinate legislative and non-legislative devolved bodies in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and in those parts of England, which now have directly elected mayors and combined authorities. And the problem which arose, which I think will increase with time, uh, was shown by um, the issues that arose when agriculture and fisheries were being returned to Britain uh, after, or will be returned after Brexit when instead of being returned to the devolved bodies, they were for perfectly good reasons. Some of the powers were being retained at Westminster in order to preserve an internal market in the whole United Kingdom. And that w w uh, came to the Supreme Court. I think Johnson must have been there at the time. But, um, uh, the, and the, it, it was decided, no, no doubt rightly, the Sewell Convention was not justiciable. 
but this does leave open huge questions about the appropriate balance, rights and obligations, both of Westminster and the devolved bodies. And I think it's absolutely urgent that if we, are, if we are to hold the United Kingdom together, we frame them in a document that has more force than an everyday statute which can be repealed at will by Parliament. And finally, the question of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which I agree with Jonathan is not a very fine piece of legislation. In my view, that does illustrate the case for a constitution because it shows how very fundamental change can be brought in rapidly without proper scrutiny uh, for political reasons by a cobbled up majority after 2010. And I have to regret to say it was steered through Parliament by a former pupil of mine, Mark Harper MP, though I imagine the draftsmen are to blame for the mistakes and not my former pupil. Thank you very much. And now, Jonathan. I think one of the problems about having Vernon's long and distinguished academic career is that just about everybody who has mismanaged our constitution over the last few years will have been a member, will have been one of that group. Um, the, I, I will make a number of quite short points in response to what Vernon has just said, because on the essence of his views, of course, I've already um, sought to answer it. Um, first of all, let's look at referenda. Um, uh, all the issues which he has suggested might have been the subject of referenda, uh, the euro, uh, regional devolution, and so on, strike me as classic examples of the sort of issues uh, which cannot be formulated in yes and no terms, uh, those being the only terms that are actually suitable for a referendum. Um, it is difficult to see how we can do that without a legislative decision first, which the uh, uh, electorate would then either say yes or no to. That's really the only way of doing it. Uh, and uh, um, it, for that reason, it doesn't actually answer the problem which he posed at the outset of his observations, which is a situation in which there is a consensus or near consensus among political parties uh, from which the mass of the uh, affected population differ. If you have to have legislation and then a confirmatory referendum, you're not solving that problem. Now, uh, by way of illustration and turning to Brexit, Vernon says, well, Parliament failed to implement the referendum. Uh, I think that this is completely unrealistic because it requires one to form a view as to what uh, the uh, referendum result actually means. Um, uh, Parliament has, it is quite correct, by a large majority voted to serve the Article 50 notice and therefore to leave. But there has been no consensus within Parliament about what the relations between this country and the EU should be after leaving. So you ask yourself, well, what does the referendum result tell us about what those relations should be after leaving? The answer is it tells us absolutely nothing at all. The Brexit party says uh, that the referendum means that we should have no relations with the EU that would involve any binding obligations on our part. Itself rather an unrealistic view. Uh, others say that there should be a, a customs union membership. Others say that we should remain part of the EEA. All of these various solutions are equally consistent with the referendum result. Uh, each side, each, the advocates of each solutions say, well, this is, must be what the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the people who voted to leave intended, notwithstanding that the campaign was fought on the basis that we would continue to have uh, close relations which would be easy to get on our own terms with the EU afterwards. All of this illustrates the, the enormous practical difficulties of formulating uh, questions short of a legislative answer requiring confirmation that are actually capable of being submitted to a referendum. Uh, as to uh, Vernon's argument about uh, the need for a constitution, uh, I do not see that the position as between the United Kingdom and its constituent nations, including Scotland, is in any doubt. It is set out in the Scotland Act. Now that act can be amended and it may well need to be amended in some respects. But I do not see that a constitution uh, can define uh, our relations with Scotland uh, in any way that is not equally open to us to achieve by ordinary legislation. The only difference is that if we do it by way of a written constitution, we lock ourselves in uh, to whatever arrangements uh, we may have agreed at the time the constitution was drafted. Uh, and if our relations with Scotland uh, over the last uh, nearly 20 years, 
are anything to go by, what they demonstrate is that this is not an, in, an inflexible or immovable situation and does not therefore lend itself very well uh, to something which is almost impossible to amend. Thank you very much. Now it's the audience's turn. Uh, we have some um, roving mics and I shall do my best, despite the, the bright lights, to uh, spot people. I can immediately see a hand up over there. You've got a microphone. Hello, thank you. Yes. I have a question for Lord Sumption. If we are to continue using referenda in future, which of course seems quite likely, are there any steps we can take to avoid the problems you've highlighted in your speech and in the reef lectures? Or is the only option to abandon the referendum process entirely? I think that with the exception of confirmatory referenda, which are essentially conditions of legislation that has already been passed, which is the, the Swiss and French system and that that applies in a very large number of other countries, with that exception, uh, I think that the problem of referenda are inherent in the whole device. Now, obviously, this doesn't matter much if you are dealing with an issue about which people do not care very, very much. Uh, a good example might be the alternative vote referendum of 2011. Um, that wasn't a particular problem, partly because it was a confirmatory referendum, but also, I think, because it's not an issue which generates terribly strong feelings. People have views about which the best voting system is, but they do not go into the streets and shout about those views. Um, so I think there is scope for referenda in some uh, issues and for some kinds of referenda. But I do not think that there is any scope for using referenda uh, to deal with value-laden issues to which the answer is neither yes or no, but it all depends. Uh, and certainly not issues which divide us uh, into groups with very strong feelings on the subject. Those issues, to my mind, call for a political solution. Well, I think everyone would agree that we need a referendum before a part of the United Kingdom should be allowed to secede, whether Northern Ireland or Scotland. There's a very good illustration of that from 2014, that uh, in 2015, uh, the SNP won 56 out of 59 seats in Scotland, but the 2014 referendum showed that people did not wish to uh, leave the United Kingdom. If it hadn't been for that, the SNP might well have claimed a mandate for secession that would have been perfectly possible and Jonathan I, I hope I've understood what you've said I find difficult to hear to my right I and mean, that's a comment about the acoustics not about politics but I, I mean I he said he favors uh, confirmatory referendums but there's a sense in which the European Union one was confirmatory because the government said we have redone a negotiation, a renegotiation, and we strongly recommend that people should stay in the European Union. And the Liberal Democrats supported that, and the Labour Party on the whole supported that, perhaps a bit weakly, but the people did not support it. And I therefore raise the question of whether it's right for this country to stay in the European Union if the majority do not wish to do so. Right, okay, now I've got two or three hands going up, so I'll take a, a collection of questions. Yes, I think Henrietta, you've got a few hands near you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is for Professor Vernon. Should a written constitution be adopted, don't you think that the judiciary will be branded as unelected representatives when they interpret the laws? Also, will the judiciary be permitted to adopt the living instrument approach of the Strasbourg court when okay. some of the, um, the laws are rigid and unclear? Okay, thank you very much. Now I'll take a couple more questions and then I'll ask our panel. Shall I, shall I repeat? Yes. Shall I repeat yes, the question? Repeat yes. Um, well, just trying to paraphrase it. First of all, if, well, if we were to adopt a written consti constitution, what would the role of the judiciary be? And ought the judiciary under such a system to adopt a living instrument approach to the interpretation of the constitution? Okay, now, there were a couple more hands in the middle somewhere. Yes, 
my question uh, is also for Professor uh, Bogdanor, particularly in the light of what you just said about the relationship between the Scottish independence referendum and then the result of the subsequent general election. Would it not be possible to argue that the 2017 general election was to a degree a response to the referendum in 2016 and similarly that the election next month will also be a response to what has happened since 2016. And in my view it is, and therefore to say that, to describe what's happening as a, as a parliamentary crisis rather than a constitutional crisis uh, is wrong. Okay, were people able to hear that? Yes, okay, and then there's another hand and another microphone, yes. Can you stand up and speak slowly for us? Thank you. Is the debate between having a perhaps representative democracy and a direct democracy, i.e. representatives and referenda, not missing a particularly unique solution of a more proportional system that would remove the division between what the representatives say and what the people want? Thank you very much. I think we could hear that. Good. And another hand around there, yes. And if you wouldn't mind standing up and so we can... Um, oh, where okay. is it? Okay, <laughs> um, sorry, yes. yes I, I would just like to contest Lord Sumption's statement that referenda are a device for circumventing the political process and that they're not suitable for issues where strong feelings are at stake. And I'd like to do so with an example from Ireland. Um, last year we had a very divisive referendum on a very emotive issue of abortion um, and we did not circumvent a political process because we had a citizens assembly which was a whole process for about a year where people, the people were consulted on this, there were, expert, um, there were experts who gave their opinions to the people <coughs> from all sides of the debate and you know abortion is not a yes or no answer. Um, and we didn't need a confirmatory referendum in this instance because the long process of the Citizens' Assembly fed into the legislation that we now have. And although the issue is not over, as legislation, of course, needs to be implemented, the process that we had endowed the result of the referendum and the legislation with a certain legitimacy. Right. So, I'm sorry to have to... It's a long question, and I hope we've understood it. Jonathan, have you, have you got it? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone want it repeated briefly, paraphrased, or did we all get that? Okay. Right. Well, now, over, I think I'm going to ask our two panellists to respond. Um, Jonathan, would you like to respond for, to that most recent one, and we'll see what, and then Vernon um, and so Well, uh, uh, citizens' assemblies are uh, uh, the flavour of the month. I, I'm uh, personally uh, uh, do not think that citizens' assemblies really resolve any of the problems. They are... Uh, essentially ways of canvassing opinion among what is usually a selective body of people. They are not suitable methods of decision making uh, and uh, I do not see how they ever can become so. Uh, these are decisions in which everybody has to participate. I think that there, we either have uh, a process of direct democracy or a process of indirect democracy and I have uh, given my reasons for believing uh, that indirect democracy is an altogether more satisfactory way uh, of accommodating the differences between us. Thank you. Now, I, I don't think our two panellists can necessarily engage with all of the questions that have been asked, but I'm just going to see if there's anything more they'd like to say. They'll... What about the other questions? Yes, that's right, what no. I'm going to ask. Now, Vernon, would you like to respond? Well, let Vernon, me would you like with... to respond? Let me yes. begin with... Um, two issues where I really agree with Jonathan. The first is scepticism towards citizens' assemblies, which seems to me a democracy of the articulate. And the great advantage of the referendum as of an election is it gives the inarticulate an equal say with the articulate. And uh, the referendum of 2016, there are a lot of people to vote who hadn't voted for many years. I also think Jonathan and I agree uh, on the value of proportional representation. I think we both like to see proportional representation in Britain. Indeed, I think it's almost inevitable when we have a four-party system in England and a five-party system in Wales and Scotland. But even with that, uh, I don't think that obviates the need for a referendum. And uh, Switzerland, of course, has proportional representation. Ireland, which was mentioned, has 
provision for the referendum in the Irish Constitution uh, required for certain issues. I don't like the phrase direct democracy nowhere except in small Swiss cantons or New England town meetings do referendums replace the democratic system. They supplement it. Even in Switzerland, Parliament still has an important role, government still has an important role. They supplement some of the weaknesses of um, uh, the representative system. And I think I've misunderstood Jonathan, which I apologize if I have, on what he means by a confirmatory referendum. He doesn't mean, I think, confirming a legislative agreement. I think you yes, mean I a do. second referendum on the EU, no, do you? No, what I mean by it is um, a, a, a state of affairs where you pass the legislation and its, con its coming into force is conditional on its being approved in a referendum. Uh, well, that, is, that is obligatory in Switzerland yeah, yeah. and in France. No, I haven't misunderstood you then, then on, on that point. On the question about the general elections, in the 2017 election, both major parties said they accepted the result of the referendum and would implement it. They said they supported really different varieties of Brexit. It's true, the Conservatives are harder Brexit than the Labour Party. The only parties which uh, said they would not accept the result of the referendum were the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, and they, of course, did not win a majority. The reason for the 2019 referendum is a different one, that Parliament hasn't done what the major parties said they would do and what was passed in the Notification of Withdrawal Act. They willed the end without willing the means. Finally, my po the point about the living instrument, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but it does seem to me, of course, that rights develop. When the European Convention was drawn up in 1950, no one thought about LGBT rights or rights to protect the environment or some of the other rights in the EU Charter. So it seems to me our thinking on rights must be dynamic and they must develop through time, if, if I've understood the question properly. Thank you. Jonathan, do you want to say anything? Um, I'll say something about living instruments. Um, of course rights develop. Um, some rights develop um, more than others. Um, but the real question is how they should develop. Uh, whether judges uh, should develop them uh, or whether they should be developed by uh, a democratic process. Uh, I have given my reasons why I think that the latter is altogether preferable. Uh, and I think that the uh, um, whole human rights issue is a very good illustration of that. Uh, I, I don't think that the basic rules of the Human Rights Convention are particularly controversial. The controversies arise about the exceptions, the occasions when you may derogate or, de or depart from the basic rule uh, on the grounds that there is a, a proportional requirement to pursue some other conflicting public interest. If you are going to ask yourself to take just one example, how much privacy are we prepared to sacrifice in the interests of, for example, the efficient functioning of the intelligence services or the suppression of crime, uh, I think that that is not a suitable issue for judges uh, to be deciding. It's essentially a judgment between two incommensurate public objectives on which uh, the public no doubt disagrees among themselves and which need to be resolved by some kind of political process. Thank you. Now, any more questions? Right, there's someone over here, um, a gentleman, well, if you keep your hand up, I think the mic will reach you, and then there was someone over there, but, but the hand's gone down, so. and another one at the back, over there, right in, in the back row. How are we doing with the mics? Has someone uh, got one you, yet? Can you hear me? Yes, at the moment. Yeah, can you stand up? <laughs> Thank you, and if you could go slowly because of the acoustics, thanks. The Supreme Court case has caused a lot of people to say there should be approval hearings for judges. I assume this is because they feel there should be an accountability built into the system. If you look at the 2005 Act and the changes to the Lord Chancellor's role, in fact there was already a system for political accountability because there was a cabinet minister involved in judicial appointments. Is there anything you think can be done to the Lord Chancellor's role to improve the system so we can avoid having judicial approval hearings? Thank you very much. Now, where's the next mic? Over there, I think. 
Um, yes, hello. Um, on any view, the margin in favour of leaving the EU in the 2016 referendum was very narrow. Um, would Professor Bogdanor accept that if a threshold of, say, 60% or two-thirds had been imposed, that might have been a more satisfactory uh, way of uh, conducting the referendum? Thank and would you. Lord Sumption find the idea of a referendum on a very divisive issue more palatable if such a threshold were to be imposed? Right, and finally, so can Parliament be trusted to decide whether and what sort of threshold should be imposed? Thank you. And then there was another one somewhere. Yes. <clears throat> My question is for Lord Sumption. Um, you said before uh, that politics is a marketplace, uh, but doesn't uh, Professor Bogdanor have a point that perhaps politicians are not always keeping up with the mood of the public? And in particular, there is this whole issue about the elites being aloof from the views of the common man. So my question is, if that is the case, and if at the same time you don't consider referenda to be an appropriate way of um, resolving that issue, then is there some other way of addressing the disconnect between the political class on the one hand and the general populace on the other? Okay, thank you very much. So those are three questions, I think. Um, Jonathan, would you like to start this time? Okay. Um, the first question was about essentially some kind of confirmatory process or uh, executive or legislative involvement in judicial appointments. Uh, I think that this would be a spectacularly bad idea. Um, the inevitable result would be, uh, I mean, for, I think for two reasons. First of all, it's useless. And secondly, it's objectionable in principle. It's useless because what questions might one ask of a potential candidate for judicial appointment? Do you say to him, are you a Tory? Do you say to him, are you in favor of Brexit? And if you get the quote wrong unquote answer, do you say, well, this is the most unsuitable sort of person to be appointed to judicial office? Um, in practice, what happens, as we know from the United States, uh, is that sensible candidates say, I cannot answer any questions about how I would decide particular cases because I will not have heard the argument and so on. So they are distinctly uninformative occasions. Why is it objectionable in principle? It's objectionable in principle because political involvement in the appointment of judges inevitably politicizes the judiciary. It produces a situation which has now reached extreme levels in the United States, uh, where um, essentially you, uh, elections have become in part uh, a contest for the right to appoint long-standing judges to the Supreme Court. And that seems to me to be an extremely regrettable situation, which is a large part of the reason why the Supreme Court in the United States has become both a highly politicized body and a wholly predictable one in which the judges uh, belong to, effectively to parties and dig trenches around themselves. I cannot believe that that is in anyone's interest. Uh, the threshold question, um, I uh, do not favor referenda whether with a threshold or not. I certainly can see the argument for saying if you're going to have them anyway and you're asking people to go through to vote upon a change which radically transforms the whole basis of our economy and a large part of the basis of our society, it may be that more than 50% is required. But would that reconcile me to referenda? Uh, no, it would not. As to the disconnect between uh, politicians and the public, uh, I think that this is exaggerated. MPs want to be elected. Uh, parties want majorities. <coughs> there are issues on which people, uh, I mean, at one stage, the death penalty was one such issue, on which people feel differently to most politicians, but don't feel strongly enough uh, to allow it to influence their vote 
for particular parties, given that they attach greater importance to many other things in the manifesto. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that the uh, effect of indirect representative democracy is to put a break on some of the more impulsive and divisive uh, views of the majority. But if there is a settled opinion of the majority over a, a significant period, then I have no doubt uh, that the parties will adapt themselves to that and that sooner or later uh, it will happen. The fact that it won't happen at once seems to me not to be a disadvantage at all, but a very considerable advantage. Thank you, Vernon. Yes, if you believe, as I think Jonathan does, that the uh, law entrenches too much on the political sphere, it seems to me there is something to be said for the American method because it ensures that the interpretation of rights follows uh, with a long time gap the democratic process. For example, between 1933 and 1953, you had solely presidents from the Democratic Party and that meant the judges, after a time lag, uh, interpreted rights in a certain way. Uh, from uh, 1969 to 1993, you had only um, appointments from the Republican Party because the only Democratic president, Carter, by chance, had no appointments. And that also altered the nature of the court. But no doubt we don't want to go as far as that here what we do need, I think, is a much closer understanding between judges and politicians, and judges do give lectures, uh, uh, giving their point of view. They sometimes write articles for learned journals and so on, and I think that is to be encouraged, because there is a form of accountability which is not answerability, which is explanatory accountability, and I think we need a lot more of that. On the question of... Um, the um, role of the judges. We are often dealing in difficult cases with the rights of very small and unpopular minorities, such as asylum seekers, uh, prisoners, uh, suspected terrorists, whose rights are not defended, particularly in periods of moral panic, and we can't rely on politicians to defend them. In a previous period of consensus, no doubt this wasn't a serious problem, but the kind of Burkean philosophy which relies on tradition and consensus is, I think, no longer appropriate in the society in which we live. As for thresholds and referendums, we tried that out in 1979. It didn't work very well because 33% of Scots voted for devolution and 31% against, but the Scots didn't get devolution, which perhaps helped to cause the rise of nationalism, and it had the unfortunate effect of meaning that an abstention counted in effect as a no vote. And if you had had, say, a 60% threshold in the 2016 referendum, it would mean that we would stay in the European Union even though a majority were against, and it seems to me that would have much more serious consequences for our democratic system than the actual result. And I conclude by saying I think the problems have arisen because we in the liberal elite are such bad losers and will not accept the results of the referendum, which most of us do not like. We are not used to losing. <laughs> well, I think probably that um, brings to an end the Q&A session. And subject to what I'm about to say, um, we can move to the reception. But I, I would be interested to, to have a show of hands amongst the audience here. I'm not going to count it. This will just be an impression. Um, how many people, having heard all these discussions, think that we ought to adopt a written constitution? And how many people think we should not adopt a written constitution? <laughs> Well, there we are. That's interesting. But I do hope that you have all um, enjoyed or, well, anyway, benefited from the discussion. I would like to thank the audience for very good questions that various members of you have put and for your obvious interest in this discussion. And, of course, I would like to thank our two speakers, Lord Sumption and Professor Bogdanor, very much for giving us their time and also their very well thought out, carefully thought out um, opinions on these very, in my view, very, very difficult 
uh, um, questions. So thank you very much. And now I suggest we all adjourn. Well, not adjourn, anyway. Uh, have a reception. And we can go on talking. Yeah, yeah.